Where is the boy? He died. What do you mean? On the way here. They had to bury him by the tracks. They promised us two children with two allowances. Oh, so you cannot blame the boy for dying. No, I blame his mother, dragging them across the country unfed, unwashed. She was running for her life. Have you seen that girl? Filthy. Everything they say about communists is true, dirty and stupid. I'll speak as loud as I want. And that was a clip from The Book Thief. Delighted to be joined by uh, one of its stars, Emily Watson. Emily, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Well, it, it's a pleasure. Thank you. I don't think you've come on this show before. So, no, I don't think I have. Uh, it, uh, where have you been all my life? <laughs> well, you've been in my kitchen nearly every day, so there you go. Oh, OK. Well, that's, uh, that, that's very kind. So it's high time we, we sorted this out. Indeed. So the Book Thief is your, uh, is your new movie. Many people will have... Uh, I mean, it was an astonishing book, and it, it really caught everybody by surprise, I think, quite a few years back. Yeah. Everyone was talking about it. Just tell us the story and, and where Rosa Huberman fits in. It's the story of a young girl who um, is... Um, she's, her mother, her parents are communist she's on the run they're on the run and she they're taken off presumably to the camps and we never see them again and she is um taken as a foster child to live with a new family in a small town ordinary town in the south of germany somewhere and we meet the hubermans who are her new foster parents and the, her father the step the foster father is um hans who is a kindly you know he is the archetypical gentle woodcutter and i play rosa who is the evil stepmother <laughs> and she's horrible unattractive bitter nasty woman and her first reaction is that Liesel's brother has died on the journey to 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 come to them and she's furious because that means they're only get half the money yeah you are spectacularly vile aren't you? I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. I mean we're, we're certainly talking about the first hour of the movie here but you are cold and fierce. I mean, the, the worst possible person to be at the other end of a very traumatic journey for the poor girl. Yeah, and um, to me, in a way, she was. When I first read the script, I, I was, you know, I loved. I found the story very compelling, and I, I found it very moving. But I also loved the idea of being able to get my hands on something like this. It's very liberating as an actor to have that, um, you know, just that journey to go on. It's it's it was delicious to me. Why is it? Why, I mean, lots of actors say how, how much fun it is to be bad, but wh but why is that? Can you can you analyse that for us? You know, particularly with reference to Rosa Huberman. Um, well, in a way, in a way, you know, she, you, you never play bad. You never you never play unpleasant. You you always think your your character always thinks they're in the right somehow. And to me, I justified. She, you know, she was an interesting study in in what was happening in Europe at that time, and particularly in Germany massive unemployment a lot of bitterness and unhappiness because after the first world war and the depression you know everybody's fighting poverty and she's washing other people's dirty clothes to to earn a living um and she's very bitter about that and she is an absolutely a prime target for the national socialists you know for somebody to come and say to her you know here is somebody to blame for all your woes and come with us we will make everything better um and yet She's married to this man who is very awake and simple and and um, very sympathetic and he's a musician and he's a painter. And you think, hang on a second, something doesn't quite add up there. There's something between these two that is more profound and, and, and better than how she now is. And uh, then kind of the moment comes when history knocks on their door and a Jewish boy falls through and... and as many people had to make choices, they made the choice to help him, which was incredibly brave, because from that point, they are in immense danger. Would it be fair to say that, in a bizarre way, war brings out the best in her? Absolutely, yeah. I think she's, from that point open, she is like somebody's thrown a bucket of cold water on her, and she is, she's now living to defend the family that she has by default acquired and she is becomes alive she becomes in her own way happier than she's ever been um, and uh, almost to the point of becoming spontaneous and and emotional but not quite we should mention um, Sophie Nelise uh, yeah. who who plays uh, Liesel who plays this girl that you're talking about a really tough job for uh, I think she's 13 but the, the movie does a very good job of, uh, of making her appear a lot younger than that, and then she yeah. grows older during the movie. Just tell us a, a bit about what it was like working with, with someone so sort of untutored, as it were. 
Well, very interesting. Her background is that she was in the Canadian national gym team and she'd been training as a gymnast from the age of four. And so this now, now, now she's eight, she's at age 12, she's off the film and she has to choose between training to go to Rio to the Olympics or continuing her work in film. And she decides to come and do the film. So she arrives with, to us with the most incredible investment of having made age 12 a huge life choice and with a sense of self-discipline and awareness and kind of performance presence and articulacy and you know just way way beyond her years very sophisticated and and a sense of relaxation in front of the camera that takes years to achieve so she puts in this uh, very uh, impressive performance. Is it true, by the way, that she thought she was going to be working with Emma Watson? Is that, is <laughs> I think that? probably for about five minutes, yeah. I know she was a bit confused. But, th- but at the heart of this, I mean, you, you, at the heart of the film has to be the relationship between her, Liesl, and you, Rosa, and Geoffrey Rush's character, Hans. Yeah. Did, you, did you get a chance to... To re- you know, to rehearse that three-way relationship, to 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 work out what it was that was going to bring out the best of this child. Y- yes, we did. We had um, a couple of weeks, the three of us in in a room with Brian, the director, just sort of going through everything. And she was really amazed, I think, because Jeff, Jeffrey, and I talked and talked and talked and talked. We both loved talking, and we'd worked together before. And we, I felt, you know, we felt very comfortable together. We had a lot of common ground. Um, and she, after, after a couple of days, she said, I, I didn't know it could be like this. I didn't realise that you could go into things in such, you know, in such depth, um, which was very sweet. Yeah, but it was, um, um, you know, Jeffrey and I were both doing something different from our usual um, palette, I guess, in a way. He, he's, you know, Jer- Jer- Jeffrey does very kind of, he's very much a clown and he does things that are kind of larger than life and he's, um, and in this he's doing something, you know, he's like a clown on his day off. He's very simple and spiritual in a way and very keeping it very, very close to himself. And, um, and I was going the opposite. I was really a doer and a worrier and a, a loud mouth. And the fact that you said you worked together, it, it, life or death of Peter Sellers, must, it, the fact that you had that relationship must have been some, you know, fantastic solid ground. Yeah. Uh, to build I kind of knew that he wouldn't mind if I hit him around. <laughs> Which you do. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yeah. You are horrid to him. <laughs> yeah, I really am. But he's a lazy, good for nothing, so he deserves everything. Uh, I, I, for people who've read the book, they'll understand what, what the tone is. But I guess it's important to say, given what you've just told us, that this isn't a, really a war film. It's certainly not a Holocaust film. It's, no. it's sort of like a domestic drama. plays out on one street, Himmel Street, um, and... Uh, and as such feels very different to anything else set in this period. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, you know, there's, there's, there's been, there's a sort of debate about whether we're, we're ready for that. You know, can you reference the Holocaust and not make a film about the Holocaust? Um, but I, in a way to me, it's very interesting to be around that kitchen table because the decisions made there in those, in those domestic homes were the building blocks of national so- socialism, um, and you know I, th- I think it's overdue to to look at it from that point of view. One of the most shocking scenes is almost sort of in- incidental to the story, but we see essentially a Nazi children's choir, yeah. um, where yeah. uh, Liesl and her and her school friends in full uh, uh, sort of young National Socialist regalia mm. singing this horrifying song about how they're not going to associate with communists and Jews, yeah. uh, but, but sounding as sweet as, you know, St. Winifred's School Choir. Yeah. Um, and, and the contrast between the two is really quite shocking. Well, very, I mean, that was, that's one of my favourite sequences in the film. I, I think they had to get special permission to teach them that song. It's prohibited material in Germany. You can't find it on the internet. You can't get it anywhere. And it's in, a, you know, it's in a specially reserved archive, and you have to get permission to have access to it. Um, and it's a scene in which Liesl, because she's arrived in this town, she has, she's not able to read, and she gets bullied at school, and she gets into fights. And this is the first time you really see her amongst her peers enjoying herself. She's singing, part of a choir, and you know, enjoying the feel-good factor that is singing in unison with lots of children. Um, 
and as the and it and it's a book burning and she's kind of there as if it's some kind of fate or fair or parade or something you know it's got a real village fate feel to it and then as she listens to the burgomaster declaiming from the podium there is a shot where you see the innocence fall from her eyes you you see her realize suddenly what it is that's going on around her and she it, 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 you know, it sinks in. This is a terrible, terrible thing that is happening around me. But that's a real Hitler Youth song. It's a real, yeah, absolutely, hear. it is, yeah. Uh, what do we see you next uh, in Emily? Is it uh, is it the Stephen Hawking biopic? Is that is that what's yeah, coming next? Yeah, I'm I'm a, a little bit of a blink and you might miss me part in that. But yeah, no, that's a really interesting lineup. It's Eddie Redmayne playing Stephen Hawking, and um, Felicity Jones playing his first wife, and directed by. James Marsh, who is a really interesting director, I think he made that film Man on Wire. I don't know if you saw that. Um, yes, yes, there was. Um, yeah, so I think that that could be really something. And I'm about to do Everest, which is the story. I don't know if you know a book called Into Thin Air, uh, as about an ascent on Everest in 1996 that went very wrong. No, but I'm intrigued. Mm, I get to. I'm base camp manager, so I don't have to do any climbing, but. Uh, but maybe some foreign travel, Emily. Yeah, only as far as Rome, though, unfortunately. I think all the boys get to go to Kathmandu. Um, Emily Watson, we appreciate you speaking to us. Thank you very much, Dee, for your time today. It's my pleasure. Thank you.